I grew up with, you know, people telling me you're never going to succeed, like you don't know, you, you don't have any connections. And then I just ended up uh, doing it anyways. Um, and I think that's because I'm very passionate and I just i am very determined and I, I don't give up. Hi everyone, this is Ira Gardner and I'd like to welcome you to a very special presentation where I'm sharing an interview I recently did with a Brooklyn-based filmmaker who's originally from Paris, France, Fanny Tashir. And Fanny joined me in my class in multimedia journalism recently, so let's join that conversation in progress. Well, so let's wind the clock back. And uh, one of the reasons I was really excited to have you here with our students is um, can you uh, describe what your educational background in uh, uh, video journalism is or was and kind of what, where your career path has taken you from, you know, school to what happened after? Yeah, sure. So I, um, so I was born and raised in Paris, France, um, where <laughs> I did English studies. But I always wanted to become a journalist, so I ended up um, moving to Canada, and this is, that's where I did my journalism uh, studies. And then I was always passionate about photography, so I always had that photography background, and I've always been a really visual person, so it just kind of made sense to me to become uh, video journalist. So yeah, I, I would say that when I was in, in college for uh, journalism, that's when I realized that um, documentary filmmaking would become my main, uh, my main job. And then from there, um, I went back to France and started working for different news outlets. Um, and then, uh, just like filming different, you know, different things for different media companies and, and news agencies, but it was always like, it felt always like really pressured and really fat, like working in really fast paced environments. Um, so I do a lot of that, but then eventually I realized that it was not really what I wanted to do. And I prefer taking my time to tell a story. So eventually I started freelancing for different, well, I moved to the US first. Um, and then I, I started freelancing and then pitching my own stories. And I, I realized that that's what I like doing the most versus just uh, covering different events and co you know uh, interviewing different people on the go and like, a story after the next and I just didn't really like the news world. It wasn't for me. Um, but yeah, now I'm just um, uh, self-employed, just uh, doing what I love, just making documentaries and I pitch stories to different clients and clients come to me also and ask me to cover different stories. So it's, it's, uh, interesting so here is your vimeo page um anything you'd like to say about vimeo uh, what's been your experience with with using that um i mean not really vimeo is just like a really standard um site that most filmmakers use so i would say that it's just good to have um also it's a good platform if you want to if you want to share uh, a video with a client and they can like type in notes within the video. Um, so yeah, it's just a really common tool that most filmmakers use. My impression is that YouTube is a platform for uh, a lot more of the direct consumer um, and that the Vimeo platform is one where you would put more of your professional portfolio work and where you would interact with clients uh, more so than you would on YouTube. Does that seem fair? Yeah, I would say so. It's more like a website, I would say. Yeah. 
All right, let's take care, uh, take a look at this one. I really love this piece. The Super Bowl coming to Atlanta is a huge opportunity for us to show the world what Atlanta is all about. My name is Jamie Cambron, and I was one of the 11 artists selected to paint murals all over the city of Atlanta. I immigrated here when I was about eight years old. My parents made the courageous decision to uproot and really remove us just from like that violence and that poverty that we were seeing in Mexico. I started creating artwork about my experience as an undocumented student when I was a college student and finally processing the trauma and the fears of that experience. With DACA, I kind of have to plan my life in two-year increments. There's always an uncertainty of who knows what's going to happen after my work permit expires and always living like this might be my last two years. Because of how resilient you are forced to become, I don't see myself or my dreams being limited by a work permit. If I can show people that I'm not going to let fear immobilize me, then I think that's a powerful thing because it encourages people to speak up and share their stories. The Super Bowl is a huge opportunity for people to see how artists in Atlanta are having a more inclusive conversation about social justice issues. No matter what their background is, I hope that people walk away with their hearts full of the message of resilience and empowerment that my murals convey and the narratives convey. We are more beautiful if we are looking out for each other and protecting each other. And at the end of the day, I think that is the only way that we can achieve justice. Great work. Uh, what can you tell us about that project? Who would you like to know? <laughs> Uh, from pre-production, how, how did you get the, the assignment and how did you develop the story? So I originally pitched Yami's story to New American Economy. So they, don't, they didn't come back, they didn't come to me and say, hey, we have this artist that we would like you to shoot. Um, so I actually found her first and I knew that New American, New American Economy was looking for um, profiles of immigrants um, and so I read about Yami's story and I thought that it would be a perfect story for them so then I just pitched them her story and they said yeah this is this is uh, exactly the type of uh, story that we would like to, to show um, and since it was a time where um, so she still has DACA, which means that she can't, she can't stay in the U.S. for very long unless her status is renewed. Um, but she, um, <clears throat> she, it was at, at a time where she, she had like two months left, I think, on her, on her passport. So she didn't know if she was going to be able to stay or go back to Mexico, which she only lived in Mexico for like a few years of her early life. So her whole life is in Atlanta and she's a, she's a really um, prominent artist who got selected to paint uh, murals all over Atlanta during the Super Bowl, which was like a, you know, big deal. So it was just like perfect timing in terms of uh, when to shoot it. Um, and, um, and yeah, so then I just went to Atlanta. I'm based in New York right now, but I went to Atlanta to, to, f to spend a few days with her and film her, um, by myself. So I'm, uh, I'm pretty used to doing a lot of, uh, the filming on my own. So I just went there and I had like, um, an idea for, what I wanted to capture based on, you know, her schedule and what she had planned to do. And I, I had my drone with me. So I also, I also 
wanted to use it because murals are really big so you want to have really wide shots to to see the to see the full mural and its environment so it was really fun to to be able to use my drone and um yeah i spent like three days with her total so we just shot whatever we could in three days and and then i came back to new york and then i also did the, the edit and um new american economy pretty much gave me full control full creative control over the edit and in terms of shooting as well they just trusted me and i told them what i wanted to do and they agreed and um it was a pretty smooth uh, process fantastic i have three follow-up questions for that um number one and actually the, the first two are very closely related because they're basically the same issue. Uh, number one, it sounds to me like uh, research is a huge part of the job. And you, uh, how did you come across reading about this artist? And how did you come across uh, a new American economy as a potential client for that mm. story? <laughs> story of my life. I, um, well, first of all, I think I heard about New American Economy specifically looking for um, character-driven stories around immigration. And uh, I don't remember, I think I saw it on Facebook somewhere. Uh, I'm part of like a bunch of different groups um, on Facebook and other social outlets for filmmakers, freelancers, journalists. And uh, it was one of those groups where someone from New American Economy posted this with uh, contact information. And so I just reached out to them. <clears throat> and so that's uh, how some projects end up being discovered because a, cl a potential client might find a filmmaking group on social media and say, hey, we're looking for character driven stories. Definitely. Yeah. So that's, that's very interesting. And then where did you read about the artist? I actually don't remember. Okay. Uh, Cause I, I, I probably read it. Uh, it was probably like the Atlanta magazine. Uh, I don't remember, but um, yeah, I don't remember. So I'm going to guess. <laughs> it that. was during the Super Bowl, And so I think I just saw like, um, an article about her about like doing murals during the Super Bowl and then her face popped up and and, uh, and then I <clears throat> I saw that she was an, an immigrant and she had DACA and she only had like a few months left that she she might get uh, kicked out of the country and I'm just in general just very interested in those stories because I'm, my, I'm myself an immigrant I'm from France originally. So like dealing with uh, visas and uh, green cards and just being able to stay here is something that's very uh, relevant and just familiar to me. Mm -hmm. So I can relate really well with um, immigrants in general and I'm always looking for interesting stories uh, like that. But <clears throat> yeah, it's... Um, Looking for stories is always very different for every sub every uh, project. I always find my subjects or my characters in a very different uh, way. It can be through reading um, a newspaper or an article online or just seeing something that popped up on my feed and then just doing more research and then calling people. And it can be like, also just uh, meeting someone on the street or hearing a conversation or just having friends who know people who've heard stories. So it's just every time is, is a, yeah, is different for how I find my subjects. But in this particular um, project, I, I found a random article online and then I contacted her 
um, I think it was on Facebook. And, um, and then I, I did a pre-interview with her on the phone. And then from then, from there, I, from there, after talking to her and uh, after she agreed to be filmed and interviewed, I pitched her story to New American Economy. So that leads me to the, the other follow-up question I had, which is, um, what do you include in a pitch? And, and, and what is it you're communicating uh, to them so that they would uh, give you complete con creative control? Um, I usually include um, a brief, story around the the main i always usually have a, a main character um so i try to have a really concise straight to the point pitch that's usually like a short paragraph um but it has to be like and i don't know like intriguing or and like <laughs> enough that you want to know more and it has to, they're always, I always try to make it visual. So I, I include in with the pitch, like uh, photos of that person or photos in which the story is happening, the environment in which the story is happening, just to give an idea of like what the story is looking like because I'm a visual journalist, right? So a lot of my job is also making sure that this is a visual story and it can be told in a visual way. So I always try to include some photos or images with my pitch. Um, and then a link, if I do have some info online, for, you know, whether it's like uh, um, someone's uh, social media, uh, whether it's an article with more info about the story, I just try to include that as well. Um, but otherwise, the pitch has to be simple. It's just a, a simple paragraph about who this person is and what is to her problem or dilemma or what is their, what's interesting about them and why would you want to know more and and obviously it's always different depending on, on who I'm talking to and what client I'm talking to. And I have to, and that's a big part of my job too, is really knowing uh, what the market is and what media company is interest, what type of stories this media company will be interested in. And so it's really just about knowing what the need is and who their target audience is and uh, what type of stories they, they like to cover. And, uh, and depending on all of these elements, I try to write my pitch according to that. How do you develop your story structures? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, is it something you consciously think about or like how do you organize and sequence your 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 uh, clips and and just develop that that story like i mean all my stories are usually um ha like the narrative arc is really based on an in-depth interview that i do with the the main character mm -hmm. so based on the pre-interview i do with them like prior to meeting with them in person I already kind of have an idea of their story and like what would be interesting to to find out more. So I just prepare like specific questions in advance for the, the interview. And then during the interview is really when uh, I have a better idea of what the story is, um, what's... Uh, like what's at stake and what's relevant. Um, and then I usually try to do the interview first before shooting every, anything else, just because it gives me a better idea of like 
you know, their story and what they like to do and not do and uh, what's most uh, relevant in terms of uh, what I'm about to film also, because I don't want to just film whatever and then I'm not going to end up using it. So I have to, I have to know exactly what the story is. So I try to, yeah, I try to do a really solid interview with them. And I usually base the narrative arc around the interview. And then, uh, and then I, I usually shoot verite, what we call verite uh, scenes with them, which is just like observe, observational documentary style where you just follow them around. And this is when things happen and, you know, things will things will unfold and the person will start talking about their lives. And so it adds more to the story, but it's, it's kind of messy. So I kind of like to have an, an, an interview first. And um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Have you had a situation where, cause you talked about the fact that the, the fact of the matter is you have to pitch a story to the person you're asking to interview to get them to buy into uh, participation in your film, right? Mm -hmm. Have you ever run into a situation where the story you pitched and got the agreement on, um, you ended up, when doing the in-depth interview, discovering there's something that was hidden or un, um, that you were unaware of that completely changes the tone of the story? Um, in terms of, have you, have you ever had a challenge after you were uh, done with the interview where maybe the story wasn't um, uh, as, as positive or, or as clear as you had hoped it would be and, and that you would have to go back and, and revisit that person and, and say, you know, this has changed uh i'd like to be able to cut it or, or tell this other story instead have you had those situations come up yeah um it happens but it doesn't happen often because mm -hmm. my my most of my documentaries are short so i just shoot them within like one day usually um but it's happened in the past where i shoot a story and then uh, it's the client It's actually the client realizes that they want something else um, or they want more of something that they didn't think about. Um, and then I go back and, and reach and reshoot that. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it happens like you have to adapt and you have to, you know, like it's, you're dealing with real people, it's real life. So it's, it's hard to, to know what exactly is going to happen. And uh, so that's why the, I think the pre-interview is really important because you want to, you want to be prepared for the day of the shoot um, and to know as much information uh, as possible and to make sure that this is the, the story you're, you're going to tell. But sometimes things happen otherwise and, uh, and you have to kind of adapt and uh, throw it open to the to the uh, audience here. What questions do you have for Fanny? So I kind of had one for the uh, the production of like at least I guess in a lot of your like documentaries or at least the one that we saw. Was there like a crew of people like working on it or was it just you? No, it was just me. Okay, because I was it like even more so, impressive, like, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah because I've shot like weddings before like film for like film or whatever and I've done it all by myself and there's like so much that goes into it so like I do it all myself but I feel like sometimes there'd be like I like I'd want like an audio person or like an editor to help me work on that but I guess to have like um to have that full creative control I feel like helps on something like that um so like when you're working on these different pieces um how do you uh how do you, I guess, like work on it solo versus like having a team of people? Yeah, well, I, I kind of had to learn to do everything on my own. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's definitely better when I have a crew with me. Um, but because in journalism and documentary filmmaking, there's usually not like much budget. I feel like I had to learn all these skills um, to be able to just do it on my own. Uh, and that way I could get paid and I could get hired again. And um, yeah, I just, you know, it's just practice, practice makes you better. And uh, filming a wedding is really hard. <laughs> like it's, uh, I feel like it's harder than what I did, like with the video you just saw. Cause at least I had three days. I mean, yes, I was on my own and it's always challenging. Cause you know, I'm like filming, but I also have to make sure the sound is okay. And I have to sh you know, make sure light is good and um, everything, you know, and I'm also carrying gear at the same time. So it's, yeah, it's like crazy, but um at least I had three days, you know, like three days is a long time to, to make sure you have all your shots and, um, yeah. So did you have three days from like, you got the task, you filmed it, you had to do pre-production or was that strictly just filming or how was that, I guess, like laid out? Well, during those three days, like I knew I wanted to do an interview with her the first day. So we did that the first day and then she, I knew she was going to be working on different murals the next following days. So we, you know, we just kind of like went with the flow and uh, depending on like the weather too, I wanted to fly the drone when it was going to be nice out. So um, just, yeah, thinking of all these details and making sure that you, you, uh, you get the shots that you need. Like, you know, and just editing all my stuff too helps because I, as an editor, you, you know what you, you need and what you're missing quickly. So just knowing that I was going to be editing the video, I was like, okay, I really definitely need this shot. I want this shot. And so I just, I guess I made sure to have those shots. Um before I left Atlanta. So what kind of audio gear are you using? Um, I have a shotgun mic and I think I mic'd her up most of the time. So she was, uh, she had a lavalier mic on her at all times, just because it's, you never know when she might be speaking or talking to other people who are close to her. So I just, yeah, it just captures a uh, really good quality sound as well. Right. Sorry, go ahead, Juan. So you were talking a lot about getting the shots you needed. And personally, I, I share a lot of the street photography. So most of my workflow is just grabbing my camera and walking around. So in, in the video part, most of the time when I try to film a video, once I go to the editing, most of the time, none of my clips kind of match. Or like, do you normally do like a little kind of map or a sketch of what, like what kind of shots do you want? What do you want to actually have at the end video? And do you, do you overshoot? Like, do you try to shoot as much as you can just to make sure you, at the end you have something, especially in these kind of like situations where you can go back to like, you can go back and reshoot in case you miss something. Yeah. That's a, that's a good question. I always overshoot for sure. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I had like, I knew that this was around, you know, the Super Bowl. And uh, so I, I, you know, Super Bowl, you definitely want to, you definitely want to have a shot of the stadium where the Super Bowl is going to happen. Um, obviously, it's about an artist doing murals. So I wanted to have I wanted to make sure I had really beautiful shots of her and her murals. And then it's about um, her story as an immigrant. So um, I wanted to make sure I filmed some of the people, some of the immigrants who are in her art. Um, so I shot that and um, 
because it's it's also it's like kind of like photography when you do a portrait of a person you want to make sure you have those nice portraits so i wanted to capture her uh in her best light and i wanted to be authentic so i wasn't gonna put her in a weird situation you know where it's not her so i kind of you know i was just trying to be um uh, i guess natural as possible and i asked her where she usually goes to you know to work on her art and besides working on her murals so we went to her studio and i thought it would be just a really nice place to to capture her in her natural environment um and then yeah because it's about atlanta too like i wanted to make sure i had like uh establishing shots of the city as well so yeah and also because i knew uh a new American economy wanted to add graphics at some point. Uh, I knew that I wanted some wide shots, uh, like clean wide shots of the city where the text would uh, pop up nicely. But yeah, I usually overshoot because I don't know, that's, I don't want to be missing anything when I'm editing the video. The scenes, the clips where she's actually painting on the mural, was she actually still working on that mural or did she mm -hmm. reenact some of that? Um, she, so the, the, the red mural, she was like pretty much done with it. Mm -hmm. But um, she said she wanted to go back to like finish a few spots, like the golden, um, the golden uh, butterflies, um, so it was perfect because we didn't have to really reenact it, but it was definitely like mostly done, but she had like a few things she wanted to, to add to the mural. And then the blue mural, she was definitely still working on it. Great. Let's take a, a break for a moment. Is there another Great. piece from your Vimeo page that you would like us to share? All right, can I ask one more question before we... Sure. So now that you asked that, what's your opinion when in documentary films when, when the, you make the decision of reacting something that maybe you, you, di you didn't got to shoot or it was bad mm -hmm. or something? Yeah. Like, what's your opinion when people do that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I do that a lot. So it depends on like what you're asking the person. Um, like I wouldn't shoot something that looks totally fake or that's totally fake. Um, but I've found myself in situations where I'm asking the person to reenact something, but it, if it makes sense, you know, if it's like a very easy thing that they can do and that they would do anyway in any, you know, in every day. Um, yeah, I don't, unless it's like really fake and really, uh, weird. <laughs> like I wouldn't ask, I wouldn't ask them to reenact, but otherwise that's a common thing that's, um, yeah, that's done in, in filmmaking. Would you say that it's easier to do if it's a, a process thing or habit thing that they do on a regular basis as opposed exactly, to yeah. trying to reenact a particular event, like say, oh, that car, car crash that changed my life? uh not going to necessarily be able to dramatize that uh as opposed to just behaviors attitudes or or um daily sort of routines i guess would be easier to reenact yeah like for example if someone uh uh like if I, if i only have one day to shoot with this person and um we you know i want to make sure i <laughs> capture a lot of different aspects of their lives in just one day it's obviously going to be really challenging so you know i i don't i don't feel weird asking them if you know we can like uh go out and um and film them in their environment outside inside wherever you know whatever they do usually um but they, they wouldn't normally do because I'm there, but they would do it 
anyway, if that makes sense. Do you have them change wardrobes so you can denote different days or? No. Okay, yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. But um, a good example of that is my video about the Green Lady of Brooklyn. Um, Cause I only had one day to shoot with her. And uh, because she's kind of like a local celebrity in her neighborhood, um, I wanted to make sure we would, I would film her outside, um, you know, in her neighborhood. So I did ask her if we could like go out and like walk around, uh, if she could like go in, into different um, stores, but the, the stores that she normally goes to. That was fun. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> But yeah, like for example, with this one, um, she didn't have any plans to like go outside that day. But I, I did ask her if we could walk around just so I get, I could get those shots of her in her, you know, in her neighborhood. And obviously, you know, after two minutes of being outside, like all her neighbors went up to her and said hi. So that that wasn't fake, you know, it just happened as it would normally happen. So. And did you have to get all, uh, track them all down and get model releases? Actually, I didn't just because the New York Post doesn't really care. <laughs> You're right. Because, okay, so that's an interesting distinction. Because uh, I'm going to guess you had a model release for the mural artist. Yeah. Yeah. So that yeah, it depends on the client. Mm -hmm. um, but some people are really extreme about getting releases. Um which makes it difficult if I'm just alone by myself filming because I don't, you know, sometimes I don't have time to also uh, make the, pe the people sign on the spot. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, in this case, the New York Post is so big and famous that they don't really care if uh, they don't have people sign a release. Well, but also because they are a well-established newspaper. Exactly. And journalism site that it's deemed as editorial fair use just like broadcast news uh would be they don't do new uh news uh reports don't do uh model releases but documentary filmmakers most often do get model releases in order to be featured in a film that might get uh uh screened at a theater might be put on a premium uh movie channel so yeah. that's kind of one of the interesting gray areas of uh this uh, multimedia journalism is when do you need a release when do you not mm -hmm. yeah definitely i mean like you said uh, the new york post is a well-established uh company and newspaper so uh i don't know it's interesting but some other well-established media companies uh insist on getting those releases so it really depends on who you're working with Great, let's open it up for more questions. So like for a video like this, I were you, I'm assuming you did a lot of like walk around kind of like, um, you just had your camera out and you just kind of filmed what was happening, I assume? For the, the walking outside part or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just followed her like around her neighborhood wherever she usually goes. Um, and just filmed what whatever was happening. Were you using a gimbal, I'm assuming? Yeah, I was using a gimbal just to, yeah. to get those really smooth uh, walking shots. Otherwise, it's, it's, it gets really shaky if you're following someone as you're walking. And my kind of follow-up question to that was like, is like, what's kind of in your gear bag or like, what do you carry around with you? Because like, that's one thing I've always had a, like trouble with because like, when I shot, like when I shoot weddings, I bring like way more than I need to. When I go to school, I bring like my backpack, computer, cameras, lenses. And then like, I bring so much stuff. And I feel like, at least for me personally, I have the trouble or, or like, I have the issue of like bringing too much gear. So like when you are going to like shoots like this, how do you know like what and what not to bring or do you just bring extra stuff just to be safe? Yeah, well, for this particular video, I knew I only had one day with her. Uh, so I knew I wanted my, my in-depth interview. So, you know, I brought my tripod, my camera, my lavalier mic, shotgun mic, um, and uh, lights. I had one 
lead light on her face for the interview. So those were like very, you know, mandatory uh, elements. And then I had the gimbal because I knew I wanted to follow her around. So uh, I had that. And then um, I knew I was just going to capture B-roll, like very simple B-roll shots of her house. Um, so I didn't need like too much crazy gear for that. Um, and then g generally speaking, if you're filming a documentary, it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of those um, stories are run and gun. So you kind of have to be prepared to to have your camera ready for any type of situation. So um, whether, you know, it's handheld and you have to be ready to shoot whatever's happening or you know that you're gonna be limited in your environment and you're, you can just have like a monopod and um, it really, you, you just have to know where you're going and what you're getting into. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, sometimes you, you, you bring too much with you and sometimes you don't bring enough. So, it, it, you know, it depends, but I just, I guess I always try to be prepared and know in advance what kind of shots I'm gonna need. And, and, then, uh, and then I prepare my, my, uh, my bag according to that. Are you using cameras that you own or rent? And do you change up cameras for different projects? I mostly shoot with my own gear, so I have my own uh, kit. Um, but if it's a bigger project where I can rent a you know better camera, um, then I will. And then if it's even a bigger project, then I can hire a sound person, and I can hire another shooter, and I can hire you know like I can build a whole crew to work with me. Yeah, so if it's just like a small, uh, you know, uh, character profile video like this, where I know I can do it on my own, then I, uh, I just do it on my own. And are you pulling that sound into a separate audio recorder, or are you bringing it directly into your camera? Yeah, so I have a Sony A7S II. Mm -hmm. um, so I shoot with that mostly. And for sound, I, I record uh, with an external recorder, Tascam. Yeah, it's not always I ideal, especially for run and gun situations, but um, I've become good at it. <laughs> but I, I'm actually, I'm, I think I'm gonna upgrade um, soon just cause uh, I wanna be able to do more things and uh and just you know boost the value of my videos and shoot in better quality so i'm gonna i think i'm gonna upgrade soon i have another question but i want to wait and see if there's any other student uh questions anyone out there have a question uh so in looking at your portfolio uh you do a lot of stuff with uh new york post uh and like do you get contacted by them to do stuff or you say, I have this story, I want to share it. So with the New York Post, um, originally I pitched them a first story. It was my first video for them was actually the, the Green Lady video. So I came with this pitch to them the first time. That was our in initial contact. And um, they loved the pitch and they were like, yeah, we want this video. And uh, after I did it, uh, they published the video and it got millions of views on social media. So they were happy with me. And after that, we got that relationship going. So I kept on pitching stuff to them, but then they also came to me with different stories to shoot. So it's like, yeah, it's like, uh, it's like both. And then a follow-up question like, you also shot like the pink lady and purple and blue. So like, how do you find like these color, like obsessed people? Yeah, so it all started with the green lady. And um, after the video went viral, uh, the, the pink lady of Hollywood reached out to the green lady because she saw the video. 
And uh, so a green lady told me, hey, there's a pink lady in Hollywood who reached out to me. And I was like, what? There's more of you out there? Like, what? That's crazy. So then I, I kind of became passionate about like finding all these color obsessed people. And um, so, yeah, like, and then after, after um, finding the pink lady, pink lady knew about this yellow lady. So then it just became um, just like research for me to find, you know, make sure I found all of them. And uh, because I had this relationship with the New York Post and the videos were doing really well um, and got, you know, millions of views, they obviously wanted more colors and more, uh, more people like that. So, and I'm actually uh, working on a feature film right now with, with all these women. Uh, I'm going to throw in a question there, and that is, um, how do you develop the questions for the interviews? I guess it, it's, it, it all, always depends on, like, the, the story or the subject or what, you know, who I'm making this video for. Um, I don't know. It's a tough question. I just, uh, I just... I just, I'm a very curious person. So the questions come really naturally for me. I, I have so many questions for people I meet in general. So I just, uh, I try to understand who they are and why they do what they do and how. And I try to ask questions about their past. And I try to, I try to understand what's going on in their mind. So I try to be intimate with them and so yeah it's a, it's a mix of just uh being comfortable with them so like when we're actually doing the interview i'm always going to have follow-up questions and just uh questions that i didn't think about but um yeah i guess my question when my list on the recording how do you prepare them for the interview like, do you give, like, I, I know when I do an interview, I generally want to uh, I do a lot of masked uh, um, interviews where I'm, I'm not going to, they're not going to hear the question. So I kind of do a little preparatory uh, explanation about how I'm going to interview them. Do you do any sort of prepping them for the interview on camera? Yeah. Well, usually, you know, when I do the pre-interview with them over the phone, I tell them, about the expectations of the shoot and what it, you know how I usually work and um, but I, I don't like to ask them like the questions prior to the actual interview because I like it to to be very like natural and uh, I want it to be like a conversations and because um, if if I tell like I, I just notice that if I tell them the questions in advance in advance um, it won't be like as, uh, it won't feel as natural and uh, spontaneous. Yeah, so. yeah, no, I don't, I don't give the questions in advance either, I, but, but I do generally tell them that, you know, I may ask you uh, the, a variation of the same question multiple times, and it's not that I'm, uh, think you're not giving me good information, it's just I may be trying to draw out a certain point. I just kind of want to let them know that they can't do anything wrong in the interview, because I think, you know, I think you run across a lot of people get nervous when they're, when you point a camera at them. So I tend to try to prep them to know that whatever they give me is great. Uh, totally. Yeah, no, I, I try to make them feel comfortable. And, you know, I tell them it's like a conversation. And uh, we, we have, uh, you know, as long as we need, uh, they can, re we can redo the questions if they want. So I always take my time and I'm actually, when we were talking about overshooting, I usually, my interviews tend to be really long because I, I like to take the time to make them feel comfortable and to get as much out of them possible because it's so hard to get intimate with someone in just like an afternoon. So my interviews tend to be really, really long and I always, you know, I'm always like... <laughs> annoyed during the editing part because I'm like oh my god I have a two-hour interview I have to edit but I you know in return I get those really like um, 
uh, magical moments where, you know, they're going to be super, they're going to feel really comfortable at a certain point and just say this little phrase that's, I don't know, that's going to be, uh, that's going to make everything for me in the story. Um, because by, by that time, usually they just, hopefully they forget about the camera and they're feeling totally comfortable with me. Do you ever have the experience um, where like, like I've learned to just keep the audio recording even after the interview is over? Because quite often when they think the interview is over, the really good stuff comes out. Do you ever run into that? Oh yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think that's an important piece of advice to everybody is that uh, I will in fact tell people, well, this is my last question. And then they'll give me their answer and then we'll just kind of keep talking and they've stopped paying attention to the camera by that time anyway. And quite often when they think <clears throat> they're done is when they really open up. It's true. Yeah. It happens a lot actually. So what questions haven't we asked that we should have? I have a few, I guess I have like more questions. I love asking questions. Um, this one, I don't know if this is like weirdly personal to me or you, but like, have you ever been in like a creative rut? Because like for me, the last like year or two, at least for filmmaking, I haven't like really felt super creative. And I don't know if it's like me or external forces or the city that I live in because Spokane gives me weird vibes. Um, but yeah, like, have you ever been like a creative rut for like a period of time where you just feel like you can't like, you know, output anything? Yeah, I mean, it happens. It happens a lot. Um... <laughs> but you have to keep pushing. Uh, it's it's normal not to be like creative 100%, like 24 uh, seven. And sometimes it takes a long time to like produce work, make work that you actually love uh, and you're proud of. And I struggle with that too. It takes a long time. Um, but you have, I guess you have to keep trying. I don't know if that answers your question. It, it, it kind of does. That's what I've been kind of like trying to do. But um, I guess another question, which is like, Ira kind of asked it like at the beginning of this call or whatever, but like, um, do you have any, uh, I guess this is like one to two questions or whatever. How did you get in the industry slash, do you have any like um, recommendations or tips to like possibly get more into like a field like this or filmmaking? Like I grew up, uh, my parents are not journalists at all. So I grew up with, you know, people telling me you're never going to succeed. Like you don't know, you, you don't have any connections. Um, and then I just ended up uh, doing it anyways. Um, and I think that's because I'm very passionate and I just, I'm very determined and I, I don't give up. But what really helps is I would say, um, your connections and, um, just, uh, networking. Uh, I try to network a lot. I try to be part of, um, uh, filmmakers groups. Uh, I try to go to, you know, a lot of screenings. Um, so I try to do a lot of networking in, in, in my, uh, in my community and I try to, you know, uh, connect with people, even with stra strangers and people that I don't know. Like if, for example, if I watch a film that I feel really inspired by and I'm like, oh my God, this is something I really want to try to achieve for my own personal work. Like I'm not shy to go to, to contact that person and like uh, send them, a, you know, a message and tell them I really like their work and, and actually, you know, it's, it's open doors for me just by just being curious and uh, just talking to people and uh, trying to network like that. It's opened a lot of doors and sometimes really weird. Like you don't, you never know where it's going to take you, but it's given me jobs and uh, connections and uh, yeah. So I guess networking is a big thing because I came from, a place where I didn't have any connections. I didn't know any, you know, filmmakers or journalists, but um, I guess I just tried to surround myself with uh, 
similar people who have common interests. I mean, yeah, the other way of getting into it is just doing it. And, uh, you know, if you, if you're passionate about something or there's one film that you really want to make and you feel like you don't have the resources or the connections to make it happen, you, you, you're never going to get them until you try your best to do it on your own. And that thing that's something that I keep telling myself, even for my own personal projects, like, uh, I have to do it on my own, even if it's not going to look like, you know, the best, uh, quality um work possible i still have to to put the efforts and and try to make it on my own to take it to the next level or show it to people who might be interested in i don't know collaborating on a, a bigger project or you know and also sometimes you want to do something and you realize that if you don't do it now, you're, you're never going to do it anyway. So <laughs> yeah, you just gotta have to, to try. And, and, and I think practice makes better definitely. So, so I want to ask a overwhelmingly obvious question that we haven't asked, which is, uh, what has it been like, uh, being in New York during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic? It's been really weird, it's very surreal <laughs> just to go out. And the other day I went to Manhattan just to capture the empty streets. And it's just surreal. It's really wild. You know, like everybody you see is wearing a mask um, and there's not many people, like there's barely anyone actually on the streets. So it's just like empty streets and people wearing masks and like sometimes the entire families with like the kids wearing masks it's just it just feels like uh like you're in a movie so it's just uh very strange but um yeah so last uh i think that two weeks ago i started documenting um because i i think i got the virus like six weeks ago so after I recovered from that and I felt better and uh, safe, I started going out in the field and just shooting whatever I can shoot just because it's a historical moment in time. And even if I don't do anything with, with, those, uh, with the footage, at least it can serve as uh, archival footage because it's just, you know, it's just a unique moment in time that, you know, just seeing what's happening in New York, the epicenter of the crisis is, uh, like people are gonna need like visuals of that at some point. So if I don't make it into a documentary, I mean, I'm trying to um, start a new project right now uh, about the crisis, uh, but if I don't, if it doesn't lead anywhere, at least I have those archival shots that I can use for, you know, something else. What's the spirit been like in, in where you're living? I mean, you know, neighbors are, are uh, everybody's holding up pretty well. Yeah. I mean, um, I don't really like, I don't see my neighbors, but, um, I feel like it depends on the, the neighborhood you're in. Um, but I have friends in, dif in different neighborhoods who have balconies and they can actually interact with their neighbors. Mm -hmm. But I feel like people are very um, supportive of each other. I've seen a lot of people um, volunteer to help, you know, to help their communities, to help feed their communities or to help the healthcare workers. So I feel like there's a lot of, uh, like there's a lot of acts of kindness and uh, yeah, I feel like it, it brings out like good in people in a way, but we'll, st we'll see it's, it's still unfolding as we speak. So I just hope New Yorkers become nicer when this is all over. <laughs> So you're talking about um, when Austin asked a 
about like the creative kind of break. How, when do you draw the line where you feel proud of, a, doesn't, don't feel proud about a job and it's still release it? So kind of... Um, I, so what's your question exactly? Well, where do you, where do you stop doing something or like not accept a job or something like that? Because I don't know, you don't have the connection with it or you feel that like you're not going to be able to do a hunt, like do a hundred percent a good job mm -hmm. or something. Like, how do you realize like maybe this is going to get out of my hands, especially you that shoot all by yourself. I'm not sure exactly, but um, I guess it really depends on how bad I need money. Um, <laughs> but like, I try to focus on stories that I, I want to tell. And, um, but it, yeah, it's, it's, it's a weird balance. Like you, you have to make money, but also you want to tell stories that, and you want to create work that you care about. So I do both, I guess, um, right now because of the crisis, I try to put my energy into that, even though it's not, you know, I'm not making money off of it right now, but I feel like it's an opportunity because we're all, you know, we all, we're all in the same boat. Uh, it's an opportunity for me to create something that matters and that I care about versus working on a story that I actually wouldn't really care about. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. Well, well maybe, a, maybe another related question is thinking back to when you're in school, I guess, is how did you uh, stay motivated to do the assignments? <laughs> and did you ever find yourself struggling to, to produce the work for the assignments? Not really, because I was so like ready. I was so ready. I was like, I'm gonna kill everything. <laughs> I was just like so ready to be like in the real world that I, yeah, I was, I wasn't really, um, I was just really impatient, but I didn't care about like, you know, working on assignments that didn't really matter. I just wanted my, my, my diploma and I wanted to be in the real world and like work on my own stuff. So yeah, I was just so impatient. I just wanted, I just wanted to be done with school. Did you pick Canada because of their reputation for documentary filmmaking? Not really. I actually tried to um, submit my portfolio and application to different journalism schools in, in France. Uh, but in France, the school system is uh, very different. And uh, some of those schools are very, very selective and very hard to get into. Um, so most of them, you have to take a, a very competitive test um, to be able to have your application uh, considered. So I tried some of those tests. Um, different schools all over France, but I failed all of them because I really suck at um, <laughs> taking tests. I just panic and it's just not for me. So I ended up um, moving to China and uh, I just traveled and, and lived in China for a year after that. And then I just kind of was uh, thinking about what I could do and um, um, and kind of like, you know, taking my time to look for other opportunities. And, and so I, I looked at the U.S. and different schools in the U.S., but I think the, the, to, be, to be able to, um, to be accepted, it was just really crazy. Um, so I think because I... I, I looked at Montreal because also there were some partnerships between French universities and uh, Montreal universities, and it was an easier process for me to be uh, selected. And so I did a, some research about the, the journalism program that I applied to, and I contacted some students from there and some people to just, you know, make sure that it was a good program. And, and, um, uh, 
and it seemed like a good school. So I was, I submitted my application and I was accepted. And so I, I, I did it. Great. Well, thank you so very much. Uh, really, really appreciate your time today. It was really, really helpful. Thank you um, for contacting me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I did exactly what you do. I saw something I liked and I'm like, I want to, I want to know the, uh, more about this filmmaker. So that's exactly what I did. I this has been a special presentation from Spokane Falls Community College Digital Media Production Degree Program. For more information, please go to our website at www.spokanefalls.edu.